Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, students. This is Arthur Johnson speaking, and I am pleased to speak with you tonight about one of my astronomical passions, the subject of comets. I've seen a few, and I hope you will be with me to see another one later on this spring. I'll have more to say about that later on. Well, the name comet comes from the Latin come, or coma, which means hair. Uh, so uh, the Latin would literally mean hairy star or bearded star. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, they have two distinct tails. This is the comet's head down here, the little white blob. And then we have a blue streaky tail, which is mostly made of gaseous material. And then a secondary curved tail, which is a little more yellow in color and is a little bit diffuse. I myself uh, had the pleasure of taking this picture in the company of my friend Steve Wheatcraft just five years ago. This was a beautiful comet that we were able to photograph from just west of here at Verdi, Nevada. It got to naked eye visibility, but only just barely. Anyway, on with the story of comets. The Latin and Western civilization uh, name comet is, is well known. In China, they were called broom stars, and here's a uh, manuscript uh, showing them as such, stars that looked like the bristles of a broom. For much of Western history, uh, the appearance of a comet in the sky was not a thing for rejoicing. They were thought to be harbingers of evil and doom. Here are some woodcuts from the Middle Ages that kind of go in that direction. We know the name Halley in connection with the most famous of all comets, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about how that association came to be. People had been seeing comets for obviously many centuries, but nobody knew what they were, where they came from, what they meant. Just in the lifetime of Halley, Isaac Newton had announced his discovery of the theory of universal gravitation, which accounted for the planetary motions. The uh, Kepler's laws of planetary motion were uh, validated and underpinned by the discoveries of Newton. So Halley was interested to know if comets moved through the solar system uh, under the same gravitational governance. Well, he himself had seen one in 1682, and going back in history of other comet observations, he noted that a similar-looking comet with apparently a similar orbit had been seen every 75 or 76 years, going back a couple of times, and he speculated that maybe uh, this was the case of the same comet coming back every 75 or 76 years. Well, he died in uh, 1741, but not before making a prediction that that comet ought to come back in 1758, and sure enough, it did, and right after that, and ever since then, we have called it, in his honor, Halley's Comet. Here it is, seen in the year 1910. Here's what it looked like at its next return in 1986. And many of you hearing my voice, I hope, will be around to enjoy seeing it when it next comes our way in 2061. So we'll put that on your calendar. Going back in... Other historic records, it's interesting to notice uh, that it was actually seen every 76 years going back to at least 240 BC. Here it is depicted in the very famous Bayeux Tapestry, and it, it is showing uh, an appearance in the sky at the time of the Battle of Hastings in 1066 AD, when Harold of England was deposed from his throne by William the Conqueror. Here's a picture from a woodcut from 1145 AD. Well, let's talk about how comets move and what, what goes on with them. In this uh, graphic, let me see if I can get my... All right, being stubborn. Anyway, um, try one here. Okay, there it goes. In this graphic, we see the solar system um, back when Pluto was still considered to be a planet, I might add. But interestingly, here we have the orbits of three comets. Here's Comet Temple 1, which has an only slightly elliptical orbit, just slightly uh, uh, egg-shaped, shall we say. 
And we notice that at its farthest point, it only gets out about as far as Jupiter, and it only gets in about as close as the orbit of Mars. So a very mild ellipse, and it has a relatively short period of orbit, five and a half years. Here's Halley's, which comes around every 76 years, and as you see, at its farthest point, goes out just a bit past the orbit of Neptune. And finally, down here in this pink color, we see the orbit of comet Hayakutake, which came our way back in 1996 and has a 17,000-year orbit. So yeah, that's, that's a long time between returns. So comets follow elliptical orbits, but those ellipses are of many different shapes and sizes. We think that short period comets, the ones that have orbits of less than 200 years, come from a region just past Neptune called the Kuiper Belt, named for Gerard Kuiper, uh, an American astronomer. And more uh, long period comets, the ones that take thousands and thousands of years, originate in a great spherical shell of comet uh, ice balls, which is almost halfway to the next nearest star. We call it the Oort Cloud. So the Oort cloud is the source of long period comets. The Kuiper belt is the source of short period comets. In my lifetime, uh, we have revolutionized our understanding of comets thanks to the ability to launch space probes to go out and visit them. The first ones went out in 1985 and 1986 in the, in the year when Halley's Comet was drawing near. This is a picture from the Giotto probe, which was launched by the Italian Space Agency. And what we can see here are hot spots on the surface of the ice ball. This is where there are pockets of volatiles that are boiling away, sending jets of gas out into space in various directions. Every time a comet nucleus revisits the inner solar system, it loses some of its material. It sheds some ice and sheds some dust. And eventually, after so many returns, there will be nothing left of it. But Halley's has been coming back since at least 240 BCE, so I think there's a good chance that you will get to see it in 2061. Here's another spacecraft picture, a higher resolution one, of the nucleus of Halley's Comet. And again, the nucleus is a dirty snowball. It's, mixed, it's a mixture of water ice, carbon dioxide ice, various gases, and chemicals, and there's a lot of dust and silt and uh, granular material in there. Here's a not very good quality graphic, but it shows the idea that when the ice ball starts to get near the sun, which it does from time to time, once every 76 years or whatever it may be, solar radiation melts the ice and causes gas to be streaming away from the nucleus, and that forms a spherical shell uh, which might be as much as 50,000 miles in diameter. That's called the coma, or the head, of the comet. Again, just a summary of the chemistry of a comet nucleus. Back in 2005, NASA sent a, pro a probe, a two-part probe, called Deep Impact, out to a comet named Temple. And it was in two parts, the orbiter, which took the pictures, and the impactor, which was deliberately launched to crash into the comet nucleus and stir up the dust and give an opportunity for spectroscopic observations. Uh, the result was a bright flash of light and a 500-foot diameter crater was formed. In the analysis that followed, it turned out we could gain some additional information about the rocky material that was contained within the comet. Well, I'd like to go through memory lane and tell you about some really wonderful comets that history has recorded for us. Uh, this is the Great Comet of 1744, also known as De Chazot's Comet, and it is depicted as having seven tails. Uh, I'm not quite sure where that came from, whether there were seven different grades of particulate matter or just what was going on, but such is the record. De Chazot's Comet, the comet with seven tails. In 1843, the longest comet tail ever yet observed was seen in this great comet. It was over two astronomical units long from the head 
to the end of the tail. And remember, an astronomical unit is the distance from the sun to the earth. So hugely long comet tail, 1843. By 1882, photography was around, not a very good quality, but hey, here's an actual photograph of the great comet of that year. Entering the 20th century, we all know about Halley's Comet, uh, and it is not so well remembered that there was actually an even brighter comet seen in January of that year. This was seen in daylight, actually, and here's a painting that was made of it. There have been a very few comets in history that get that bright. One that did was Comet Ikea Seiki in the, the autumn of 1966. I was in high school at the time and uh, had come to learn that this comet was expected. I went out and tried and tried to see it, but I was in Los Angeles where it's foggy and smoggy almost every night and I never did. But people with better luck and better locations went out and got this astounding picture. This too was a daylight comet and it came so close uh, to the solar surface that it actually broke into pieces from the tidal forces, the gravitational forces of the sun. Fantastic daytime comet. In 1976, the year our country observed its bicentennial, we had a wonderful comet visible called Comet West. Now remember, comets uh, take their names from the discoverer. So there was an amateur astronomer named West who was the first one to see it, and we call it by his name. Again, notice, please, the two distinct, well, actually more like three tails. We have the dust tail here, and uh, I'm sorry, I have that wrong. This is the gaseous tail, the blue one, and then the more curving, dusty-featured tail. Sometimes comets have an encounter with the giant planet Jupiter. And when that happens, bad stuff can occur. Uh, Comet Shoemaker-Levy in 1994 was on its way, minding its own business, and it chanced to come alongside Jupiter, and Jupiter's gravity was so great as to break the comet into pieces, 12 or 13 different ones, and alter the orbit so much that those pieces all smashed into Jupiter. And here are some pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope that recorded those impacts. Each of these fragments struck with the force of many nuclear bombs, so huge, huge amount of energy released. And we could even see these dark scars on Jupiter for a few hours with amateur astronomer quality telescopes. So it was really, really something. In 96 and 97, respectively, we had two wonderful comets. In 1996, Comet Hayakutaki was seen Naked eye, easy to see. And one year later, probably the almost certainly the greatest comet of my lifetime thus far, Comet Hale Bob. This one was visible to the naked eye for 18 months. And in the spring of 1997, it put on an amazing show. And I can remember there was one night when we not only had this beautiful naked eye comet, but there was a total lunar eclipse going on that same night. Talk about a night to remember. Once again, I draw your attention to the two distinct tails. There's the gas tail that's blue and the dusty material in the curving yellow colored tail. Really wonderful picture. You won't have heard of it probably unless you uh, were living in the Southern Hemisphere, but this comet, Comet McNaught, has been the brightest comet of our 21st century so far. It was a spectacular object, uh, but it was at its best when it was so far to the south that only uh, observers south of the equator could really enjoy it in all of its magnificence. Well, closer here to home, and not so many years ago, uh, Dr. Case and I were actually in my front yard. He will well remember this. And we used my camera and just an ordinary telephoto lens and bagged this picture of Comet Pan Stars. It was naked eye, just barely. It wasn't a hugely wonderful comet, but at least it was a naked eye comet. November of 2013, we had a promising comet called Ison, but it was on a path that brought it so close to the sun that we tracked it 
as it was getting closer and closer to perihelion, it was getting quite bright, and then it rounded perihelion, and it never came back. That is, it was seen no more. And from that, we can infer that the cosmic ice ball of this comet was simply melted away, completely uh, gone. Never came back. End of story. This is a photograph of the nucleus of a comet, which is named for two Russian astronomers, and I will not attempt to pronounce it. But anyway, this one came around, and uh, to give you an idea, it's about 2.7 miles by 2.5 miles long. And just to see how big that is, let's superimpose it over Los Angeles. Uh, and you get the idea that uh, they're not huge by astronomical standards, a few miles wide. But uh, they're pretty big, and uh, if one were to hit the Earth, it would not be very fun. Uh, the biggest one, by the way, ever uh, that we have seen was the Hale-Bopp nucleus. It was thought to be something like 60 miles in diameter. Now, Hale-Bopp, incidentally, uh, will return in the year 4385. So it's definitely a super long period comet. There's an association between comets and meteor showers. As a comet goes around many, many, many times, it sheds little bits of its material, and it, this material gets spread out more or less all the way along the elliptical path of the orbit. And so, in the case of Halley's Comet, for example, the Earth crosses the orbital path of the comet, even though the comet isn't anywhere nearby, but once every May we go through it, and then in October, we go through it again, and it gives rise to meteor showers, which are occasions when we have larger number than ordinary of shooting stars. Here is some artwork of a great meteor storm that was seen in much of North America back in the year 1833. Now, could a comet strike the Earth? Certainly could. Has, has it done so? We're not exactly sure. Um, the demise of the dinosaurs was more probably a small asteroid impact. But in 1908, in Siberia, there was a huge explosion in the atmosphere that was responsible for blowing down all the trees in the forest for many miles in every direction. And it is speculated that a small comet nucleus may have hit the Earth and exploded in the atmosphere. So take that. Well, I've come finally to what I promised you at the beginning. There's at least a chance that you and I will be able to witness a fine comet in the next couple of months, Comet ATLAS. Uh, and that's an acronym, by the way. It was discovered by an automated telescope system, which is called the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System. That's a mouthful. Anyway, that observatory in Hawaii made the discovery and we calculated the orbit. The uh, orbit is going to bring the comet to its closest to the sun on the 30th of May. That's just a little bit more than, uh, than a month from now. I'm sorry, make that about two months from now. Uh, and it will be very close to the Earth a few days before that. It's following an orbit that is not unlike the orbit of the Great Comet of 1844. Uh, and we can't know for sure, but there's a pretty good chance that it will at least reach naked eye visibility, might possibly become a spectacular showstopper comet. Uh, maybe not, but uh, it's something nice we can think about on this particular evening. So with that, I want to leave you with what I hope is a peaceful picture of a comet, and thank you for your attention. I know we're going through some tough times right now, and I surely do appreciate your being with us in the class tonight. I'm going to stop the presentation now, and we'll take your questions uh, if you have some. So let's go to our dialogue box, and we'll carry on.